I would strongly advise everyone to do something like an hour of code, um, whether it's processing or Arduino or whatever it might be. Welcome to STEM Power. My name is Valerie Han. And I'm Sid Sadish. Joined with us today is Dr. Brandon DeHart. For all of you technology lovers out there, Dr. Brandon DeHart is the manager of the Waterloo RoboHub, which is a training and research facility that aims to implement the use of robotics in many aspects of society. In fact, RoboHub was actually featured in Robert Downey Jr.'s documentary, The Age of AI where he explores the rise of artificial intelligence and showcases innovators who are pushing the boundaries. So, Dr. Duh, what is it that you do at RoboHub and what are some of your hobbies or interests? Hi folks, thanks for having me on. I am the manager of the RoboHub, which means I kind of take care of the day-to-day -day activities, I help uh, the researchers, I connect with industry, I deal with um, kind of all of the admin side as well as lots of the technical side. Uh, I have a few people on staff. We have a humanoid specialist and a full-time technician as well as several others. Um, and uh, I've been interested in robotics since I was very young. Uh, I think I decided in maybe grade eight or grade nine that I was going to go to Waterloo um, for engineering, specifically something related to robotics. Uh, by the time I actually went, they'd introduced the mechatronics program, the first of its kind in Canada. Um, and I was in the second class of mechatronics, I believe. So I've been interested in robotics for education, exploration, and uh, entertainment for quite a long time now. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So you kind of knew from uh, your pre-high school years that you kind of wanted to go into robotics, right? Yeah, I've been, uh, even at that time, I was kind of playing with hobbyist, uh, hobbyist type robotics. So we obviously didn't have uh, Arduinos and, and and kind of easy access to lots of servos and things that are available now, but we uh, we we may do with what we could get our hands on. That's that's awesome. So uh, thank you so much for your introduction. And now that we all know Dr. DeHart a little better, let's dive right into our discussion. To start, what is RoboHub's philosophy, and what is it that you aim to do? So the RoboHub is uh, very much kind of lives at the intersection between collaboration and robotics. Um, so whether that's uh, teams of robots working together, robots working with humans, uh, people who do robotics working together, so academics working with industry, um, getting professors from various institutions to work together if they have common interests, common goals. Uh, it's a lot of that, that side of it. Um, and part of that also uh, looks at kind of four main pieces of the robotics problem within the research space. Um, so the lowest level, the control piece, we look at control for our humanoid robots. Uh, we have a couple full-size humanoid uh, kind of two-legged walkers with arms and legs and head and sensors and that kind of thing. Uh, we also look at the planning and perception side. So looking at what's coming in from cameras, how do you interpret that? Uh, what information is that? And how can you then plan your actions and reactions if there's a person in the loop or if there's multiple robots trying to coordinate themselves? And then on top of all of that, we primarily focus on uh, the interface piece. So human-robot interaction, human-robot interface. So how do you tell the robot what you want it to do? Um, how do you interact with it when it's actually performing its task? And we look at a lot of questions there related to uh, the kinds of interface you can have. So are you physically moving the robot around, telling it what to do, showing it what to do, writing code to show it what to do? Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can interact both you know, before the task and during the task. And most of that is, is a, big, a big focus for us. So actually, our next question plays into your answer perfectly. Where do you see the application of robotics being used in the future? So do you think it can be used in medical practices and maybe even special needs assistance? Uh, I think that's definitely a big part of it. Uh, we actually work a lot with Canova Robotics in uh, Montreal and uh, Quebec. Mm -hmm. um, and they are a uh, kind of assistive robot company. They design kind of lightweight robot arms. I actually have one on my desk right now here. Um, that you can attach to, say, the side of an electric wheelchair. Uh, and it enables someone who has upper limb mobility um, concerns or anything like that to be able to kind of take something off the shelf, reach something out of the fridge, pick something up off the ground, things like that, using a, a robot that's controllable using either a joystick or a tongue interface, whatever kind of level of uh, control capability one might have. We also see a lot... Um, of transportation, kind of intra logistics, where you're needing to move items around in the hospital, uh, move packages around in the building, those kinds of things. There's lots of that kind of office, uh, home, kind of apartment building type 
robotics that is really coming, coming to the forefront these days, as well as collaborative robots um, that have force sensors, torque sensors, so that they know when they have kind of pushed on the world how, and if the world is pushing on them, and they can use that to kind of respond a little bit better than most of the kind of classic industrial robots that you have out there today. Mm -hmm. uh, that's super cool. And if I may add to the initial question, do you think that robotics will help major global crises such as climate change and its impact on global warming? I think it could definitely help. There's a lot of things um, that could be made more efficient uh, and could be made more effective if uh, collaborative robots and robots in general and automation in general are added to many of these um, different fields. There's lots and lots of industrial fields and commercial fields that uh, are producing um, for, an, for instance, with climate change, producing a lot of pollution, they require a lot of uh, materials um, that need heavy processing before they're kind of usable. Uh, lots of big battery packs and things like that require a lot of processing and, and kind of intense uh, industrial kind of chemical solvents and things. Um, and many of these things, you know, if you can operate a warehouse with lights out, you don't have to run all the power for the lights to be on. If you can make it uh, a shorter distance between the efficient travel and efficient transportation of items and the homes and offices where they're ending up, you can dramatically reduce at least our impact um, on those kinds of things. Similarly, something like farming, um, there's lots of ways that you can kind of use automation and robotics to mitigate and minimize the kinds of greenhouse gas emissions that are happening or take them in and actually process them and use them to produce energy, heat, power, uh, to kind of mitigate a lot of that side of it as well. Amazing. It's good to see that robotics is having a positive influence on society. So I know that you mentioned that you kind of, you knew in grade nine and 10, you wanted to go to Waterloo. But aside from that, is there any other inspiration you had, which kind of um, inspired you to work with robots? Was there something else that's specific or motivated you to drive, drove you to pursue the field? I mean, much like many people, my, my introduction to things like robotics was uh, kind of mass media. Um, so a big Star Wars fan when I was a kid. Uh, and I always, I always wanted to build, you know, an R2-D2 or something like an R2-D2 where it's living in society and it is helpful to a degree. Um, and it can kind of complete some task on its own, needs help with other things, but it doesn't look like a person. I really, I didn't, at the time at least, I didn't really understand what all would be necessary to make uh, a robot kind of effectively look like and act like a person. And for, you know, it was fairly obvious even as a kid that C-3PO was a guy in a suit. Yeah. Um, and now my PhD work that I have just recently finished uh, last year, I guess, was working on balance and gait for humanoids. So how to make sure they're not falling over, where they should step if they are falling over, things like that. And it's still a big problem. There's, there's lots and lots of research challenges to be solved there. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, the inspiration definitely came from kind of the media and wanting to be able to uh, make something that would help, that would contribute to the world without it just being further, uh, further applications of the same kind of inf uh, information and, mm -hmm. uh, and solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, um, I think that a lot of, because it's going to be mostly students that are listening to our podcast, so uh, I think that a lot of them will be able to uh, relate to you know having inspiration for maybe what they want to do from some sort of media in your opinion what are the non-technical skills that might be essential for an engineer for example critical thinking or innovation um i think uh innovation is very nebulous so i'm going to try to avoid um avoid that one there's lots of different kind of definitions of what innovation and being innovative means um but definitely creative thinking, problem solving, um, uh, constructive criticism and analysis. Uh, what some of the biggest things, so what, one of the big things that, that most people don't realize about robotics is that uh, nobody can really do all the pieces of robotics. Um, so one of the biggest ones is teamwork and being able to work with people who um, are in different, different disciplines from you. Because a, a, a typical yeah. robot requires Software requires mechanical solutions, electrical solutions. Sometimes there's chemical solutions involved. There's the human-robot interaction piece. There's the social aspect. Uh, if you want to make it a product, then there's the commercial aspect, the economic aspect. There's legal aspects. There's lots of different bits and pieces that are associated with robotics. And even if you just want to, like, I want to make a robot. 
you're going to need to know at least a bit about mechanical and electrical work, computers, software, kind of the, the, the physics of it that's underlying kind of the fundamental pieces of all of those things. There's lots of different aspects that you need, but above all, you need to be able to work with others because it's very, very challenging um, to make a robot as an individual, even as a very, very small group. It's very challenging. I 100% agree with you, and I feel like in any sort of field, uh, teamwork is a really, really important uh, non-technical skill that everyone should possess. That's that's true. So, our, moving on, what's been your proudest moment slash achievement in your time at RoboHub, and what's the coolest project you've been a part of or led? Uh, okay, so proudest moment is probably when... We, uh, there was a few of us working together on a system where we could get our full-size humanoid robot, Talos, to actually be able to carry a table without any kind of active verbal commands or, um, you know, joystick command or anything like that. Uh, and between um, several of us, uh, primarily our uh, humanoid specialist, Alex Werner, we were able to get it to the point where the dean of engineering at the time, um, Pearl Sullivan, was actually able to come in and basically pick up one end of the table and start walking away. And Talos lifted its end and started following along and walking along uh, uh, with her. So it was great to just see like the somewhat counterintuitive way that we had set everything up so that we didn't have to give it commands of any kind. It was just kind of reacting to the world around it where it, we knew it was holding something and that thing was leaving uh, kind of pulling away from its body. So it was following along with that object without having to be given any kind of commands or anything. In terms of oh, achievement, um, I think having uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s production company come in and kind of include us and incorporate some of the work that we're doing in their series, which is making um, kind of a really good impact in terms of informing uh, kind of the general public about robotics and about AI and the kinds of impacts that they might have. Um, was really, uh, really quite interesting as well. Wow, I think that that is definitely an, an amazing achievement to to be able to be a part of. Did you get to meet Robert Downey Jr.? I was just curious, out of curiosity. Uh, no, he didn't actually come. Um, so it's uh, he and his wife kind of run the production company, but we had a number of their uh, their core people who run that that um, unit come in. We have met quite a few. Uh, big names across kind of Canadian government and industry. Uh, we have lots of uh, robotics companies, lots of defense companies, um, lots of the ministers, and and uh, uh, Justin Trudeau was here a couple times. Uh, so lots and lots and lots of people kind of across the board who are big decision makers like to see kind of what's at the forefront of technology, and obviously robotics and AI are a big part of that. Yeah. And definitely yeah. Waterloo being a prestigious institute, definitely a lot of leaders would probably think of going there first, I assume. Quite a few, yeah. Yeah. And what was it like um, on set with everybody and how did they like shoot? What kind of robots did they ask you to like show? And um, so it was quite interesting the way that we had it set up. There was kind of two pieces to it. One of them was uh, a number of interviews with several people. I believe three or four of us ended up doing interviews. Um, in the final cut, I believe it's myself and Alex Werner, my uh, kind of our humanoid specialist, who were the ones who ended up uh, on camera and talking and being interviewed. Um, and then in the RoboHub itself, uh, we did a lot of shots of various different tasks uh, that we had it doing. So following, um, we had a glove rigged up, a hockey glove rigged up with markers, and we have a full motion tracking system in the space, uh, much like we would use for movies or video games. Um, and we had it set up so that when you move the glove around, Talos would also move its arm in the same motion. If you close the glove, it would close its gripper, things like that. So you could have it kind of remotely controlled. Um, and then I think we might have done the table carrying uh, and a couple of other things, having it walking and kind of tossing poses and stuff. Um, and then we also had a uh, kind of staged piece where four or five different robots um, collaborated to kind of achieve a goal where a robot, uh, a table mounted arm um, picked up an object, held it up for a camera for inspection, dropped it into a mobile robot, which drove it over to one of the humanoids. The humanoid picked it up and then walked it over to another area and handed it off to a mobile um, manipulator, so arms on a base, 
which then took that and drove it over to Talos, but picked it up and used it for something else. So it was kind of a multi-stage process. And it was interesting to see uh, how many separate clips and angles and cameras and things were needed just to kind of get that one process. I think just that was almost a full day of shooting just to get that through. Mm -hmm. Wow. And again, uh, you talked about the mass media thing for in terms of inspiration for students. Uh, so I think that this will be a really, really fun way, like Star Trek for you, that students will be able to perhaps get inspired and maybe want to work in robotics one day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's a lot more um, content now as well that includes not only kind of that, that uh, sci-fi type robotics, Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, you know, things like that, um, but also a little more uh, realistic ones of what we can actually produce now. So they've done some, you know, lots of the mechanisms and things on Mythbusters were robots. There's been a number of shows kind of robot, uh, robot wars and battle bots and things like that, where you kind of optimize a, a robot to smash each other and light each other on fire, things like that. So there's lots of different kind of places that you can see various aspects of it these days, even just going to uh, most of the Disney parks now have robots roaming around in various pieces of their their uh, their parks. So for all the students that are listening, uh, would you have any words of wisdom for those looking to pursue a career in robotics or engineering? Um, I mean, one of the big ones would be that you really need to, at a fundamental level, you need to understand sequential logic, um, which is effectively how code works, how software works. So I would strongly advise everyone to do something like an hour of code, um, whether it's, you know, processing or Arduino or whatever it might be, um, just to get a feel for how that works and, and how you might understand a little better um, what is going on inside a robot's computer when it's kind of acting on inputs and things like that. And just playing around with something like, you know, a, a hydraulically driven robot arm or an RC car or, you know, something like that, where you can very clearly see the relationship between an input and what it's actually doing and that it will do exactly what you tell it to and no more unless you dump on a significant amount of processes and, and, and logic and things in there. And all of that, again, is, is sequential logic. So understanding how to code is a big one. The fundamentals of kind of the mechanics uh, is important. So really understanding the physics is good. Um, and then doing some electrical. So playing with an Arduino, playing with a microcontroller, understanding you know, how sensors work, how motors work, stuff like that. Because that, that will get you kind of the fundamental pieces that you need to do, to do something with uh, robotics. Uh, I think that's some really, really good advice. So thank you so much. I think our listeners will definitely benefit from what you said about, you know, coding, understanding the fundamentals of anything that you want to go into in the future is definitely a necessity. So um, unfortunately, we've reached the end of this STEM Power episode. Again, Sid and I would like to thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak with you. I, for one, have learned a ton about the roles and possible applications of robotics, and I'm sure the same goes for our listeners. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. I agree with you, Valerie, 100%. I thank you all once again for listening to this episode of STEM Power, and hope you have a good day, everyone.